Video games ask you to master skills to overcome challenges. And how do they do this? With carrots and sticks. The carrots are how the game rewards players for doing well. Think points, better weapons, unlockable content, the same way you'd give a horse a carrot for doing horse stuff. The sticks are the way the game punishes the player, like being whacked with a stick. L lots of horse metaphors here. And the strictest punishment short of game over? The fail state, death. So let's talk about fail states, how they've evolved, and how they're threatening the very existence of video games as we know them. But don't worry, it'll be fun. Part one, the arcades, where dying costs you, literally. Let's go back to the infancy of video games, the arcade. Failure costs lives and quarters, but not progress. If you die, you simply respawn in the exact same spot, minus one of some limited number of lives. Lose enough lives, and it's time to hit up the change machine again, buddy. This design was pretty smart. Arcade games were meant to be quick and digestible, and with games that sat in public spaces, the business model was built around converting your frustration into stacks of your hard-earned quarters. That all changed when games moved into the home. Odyssey, a new dimension for your television. With the rise of console and PC gaming, suddenly it wasn't necessary to focus on bite-sized gameplay. People were gaming for long periods of time, and I mean long periods of time. It would be decades before developer revenue would be tied to gameplay again in the form of microtransactions. Suddenly, when you bought Super Mario Brothers outright, you could die over and over again. It didn't matter how long it took you to kill that Hammer Brother, you never had to pay another cent. Those changes weren't immediate. It would take years for games to slowly outgrow their old contrivances. Some games stayed with the three lives in your out system for a long while, making many games impossible to beat without cheat codes. Everyone claims to know a guy who knows a guy who beat Contra without the Konami code, but I have my doubts. Still, it was in this environment that games evolved past the death and quarters paradigm and into the diverse offerings we have today. Games could start to tell stories. Part two, checkpoints, rethink and respawn. Today, failure usually means returning to a checkpoint. The clock and enemies are reset and you get to try again. Right. It's like Groundhog Day or Edge of Tomorrow or dating. You get to learn from your mistakes and take that wisdom with you the next go around. I am an immortal. The game provides a little bit of punishment, a minor whack from the stick, but doesn't prevent you from completing it once you've developed the skills. There's no need to restart from level 1-1, just dust yourself off and try again, sport. Even still, those resets have changed dramatically over the past 15 years. Today, setting you back even 5 or 10 minutes is likely to garner criticism for poor checkpointing or sucking ass, and fosters a lot of rage quitting and broken controllers. Holy fucking shit! By contrast, modern games like Arkham Knight or Tomb Raider rarely ask you to replay even 60 seconds of gameplay. This hasn't always been the case. One of the most well-remembered console action games has to be GoldenEye for the Nintendo 64. That game was awesome, but GoldenEye's single-player missions were brutal, sometimes requiring perfect stealth. A failed mission would send you back to the very beginning of the mission. But that sort of punishment wasn't so uncommon for the time period, until things started to change. First, games started telling more intricate stories. That's right. With stories as an increasingly critical piece of the game's package, developers started to see how challenging checkpointing could also undermine storytelling. When a game has a narrative with a beginning, middle, and an end, replaying the same part without ever seeing the payoff lets all the air out and, well, kinda sucks. This is especially true as games started to add cutscenes, dialogue, and tremendous technical set pieces. No one wants to watch that same three-minute cutscene over and over again. The narrowing of checkpoints also reflects an aging gaming demographic. When gaming was in its infancy, it was associated with children or young teens. For younger gamers, it's not a big deal to spend the day replaying a mission to perfectly master a level. But I'm a grown ass man. I've got precious little time to game. As gamers get older, they've become more likely to have a full-time job, children of their own, or other obligations that would leave less time for gaming. For them, being forced to replay a lengthy section or to continue playing for a long stretch to reach a distant checkpoint creates fatal levels of frustration. So maybe this narrowing of checkpoints is good for gaming. Part three, frustration-free gaming sucks. As with all things, there are some downsides too. By smoothing over friction, a developer drops one of the most powerful instruments in his toolkit, Fear. Yes, the fear of that stick we were talking about earlier, since we're all just a bunch of horses. Even in the virtual world of video games, dying means loss. Lost money, or loot, or points, or respect, or whatever. In almost all cases, it means loss of progress and time. By minimizing those losses, games minimize the risk. And just like in real life, you can't have thrill without risk. Without the stick, 
the carrot wouldn't taste nearly as sweet. We all play games to engage with that risk. It's why we don't play games on god mode. Without that fear of loss, there's no pleasure in the triumph. Nowhere is this evolution clearer than in the Far Cry franchise. The console version of Far Cry 2 was much maligned by people who hated respawning enemies, dreary landscapes, and yes, a jacked up checkpoint system. Instead of dying, an NPC friend would appear to drag you to safety. In some cases, the NPC could get injured or even die in the rescue effort. Nice work, dude. And when they did, they were gone forever. If you died without an NPC friend to bail you out, you were forced to go back to your last stop at a save cabin, which could be far away and make for tons Tons of lost progress. To add insult to injury, the map was spread out with extremely limited fast travel options. Even getting to a mission in Far Cry 2 required crazy long treks across desert and jungle where you could be ambushed at any second. The result was a game where failure could lose you substantial amounts of time, effort, and progress. Combat in Far Cry could be terrifying just by virtue of how much you could lose by failing. And fail, you could. Enemies were smart and accurate, and how about that infamous weapon degradation? Your weapons rusted over time, causing older guns to jam unexpectedly. Talk about getting the stick. Yet Far Cry 2 quickly developed a passionate cult following. Every firefight seemed to matter. If you didn't want to lose all your work and time, you had to plan carefully, to keep your wits about you and to expect the unexpected. Some masochistic fans even tried to take the game's strictness a step further with permadeath playthroughs. Essentially, these sick people would give themselves one life, forcing themselves to cautiously inch their way through the entire game without a single death or reload. Talk about fear of loss. To this day, fans fondly remember how engaging Far Cry 2 was, however they played it. But as I said, Far Cry 2 pissed off many gamers, and developer Ubisoft Montreal responded to those complaints in the franchise sequels. Far Cry 3 and its successor Far Cry 4 removed almost all of the fear and discomfort for which Far Cry 2 was known. Producer Dan Hay even addressed the issue directly in his interview with CVG in the months leading up to its launch. We want to give the player the opportunity to turn on the action whenever they want. We want to make sure the AI isn't just hammering you with bullets. We want to let you move around the periphery of the area, making the game wait for you. Regarding that crazy degrading weapons thing, he commented, we don't want to punish the player. So the reality is that when you pick up a gun, you're going to shoot it and you're going to be successful. The buddy system was removed, good riddance, and auto saves and plentiful safe houses were added to the game. Far Cry 4 doubled down on that modernization, employing automatic checkpoints before any significant encounter. By Far Cry 4, failure rarely cost more than a few minutes of progress. The marketing also played up the whimsy and mayhem. The message was clear, come have fun, fuck shit up, don't worry about making a mistake, we won't give you a hard time about it, you have nothing to lose. And the message was well received. Far Cry 3 and 4 were incredibly well reviewed, and they are undeniably fun games that anyone can casually pick up and play for a few minutes on a relaxed afternoon. But after playing all three games, it's hard not to think that something cool was lost when the harsh edges of Far Cry 2 were sanded down. It's not just that the difficulty was dramatically reduced, it's that the player was no longer compelled to learn. The fear of loss was gone. Too many carrots, not enough sticks. Part 4. Innovation. New ways to avoid frustration. Given the fact that everyone likes to win, it's not surprising that developers have continued to look for new ways to help players finish their games without pissing them off too much. What is this, easy mode? Games like Bioshock and Battlefield Bad Company abandon the checkpoint for a respawn system. Instead of rewinding time, the player is remade in a fight that is still ongoing. It's almost like the old arcade games, but with infinite quarters. While common in multiplayer gaming, such systems have always been unusual in home single-player games. It's like gaming with training wheels. In Bioshock, dying would lead to a respawn in Vita chambers without any lost progress. The cost was a little in-game money, but other than that, you could respawn infinitely. You're more like the agents in The Matrix than Tom Tom Cruise's character in Edge of Tomorrow. The benefit? Players never waste time. They never have to explore the same room, listen to the same dialogue, or kill the same enemies. But Bioshock's Vita Chambers is also a great example of how reducing frustration undermines learning from risk. You see, in traditional checkpoint games, repeating the same failing strategy is bound to produce the same result. Rush into a situation without careful consideration, and you might find yourself facing a game over screen. But in a respawn game, that isn't true. Players can just whittle down challenges by dying and re trying, essentially ramboing their way through tough situations without ever understanding why the game keeps beating them. You can beat Bioshock without ever actually getting better at Bioshock. This was incredibly apparent with the game's Big Daddy fights. Big Daddies were the bullet sponge bosses, and they were unique in that players got to choose when to fight them. Smart players would lay traps for Big Daddies and trigger them into fights with enemy AI, beating them or at least devastating them before firing a single shot. 
But a player could also rush in guns a blazing without a thought to any sort of strategy. The result? Player death. Lots of it. And a significantly weaker Big Daddy that might be vulnerable to the second or third attack upon respawn. The player could be rewarded for winning without ever having to change. Similar reasoning applies to the down but not out systems that have been increasingly common in AAA shooters like Killzone 3, Gears of War 3, and Halo 5 just to name a few. In these games, instead of returning to a checkpoint, the player falls to his knees and waits to be resurrected by an AI-controlled teammate. Besides the infuriating wait for the slowest AI buddy ever, this has the same effect as Bioshock's Vita Chambers. You don't have to understand those games to be good at those games to beat those games. Where's the fun in that? Conclusion, are games still games? In an attempt to reach more players with more diverse lifestyles and limited time, these attempts at time-saving features are admirable, but they also pose an existential threat to what games are. The loop of learning and reward and punishment is exactly what makes a game a game. Leave video games aside for a second and think of a basketball. You can dribble it, you can pass it, you can bounce it off your friend's forehead but it's still a toy. It's not a game. Basketball becomes a game when it has rules, when it's constrained by success and loss, risk and strategy. This is why the Iliad is not a game, but chess is. We risk nothing when we read the Iliad, except a possible paper cut. <laughs> it's worth stating the obvious here. It is no more inherently wrong to reduce player frustration than it is to say there's something wrong with the Iliad. There's nothing wrong with storytelling for its own sake. Some of the most entertaining titles of the last few years have met that description. In Gone Home, the player gets to inhabit a woman returning home from college to find revelations about her family. There are no puzzles or fights. You can't lose at Gone Home, and the only way to beat it is to finish the story. By the definitions I've discussed, Gone Home is definitely not a game. It's probably best to described as some new form of interactive entertainment. We can make similar arguments about games like The Stanley Parable and Journey. They're pretty far from being pure games, but they're still awesome. But now you see how removing the punishment of failure in traditional games like shooters and racing games undermines so much of what's cool about playing a game. By smoothing all that risk and loss, we also smooth out strategy and success. We lose engagement. All because we're all so eager to eat that damn carrot. Hey guys, thanks for watching. We've got more great stuff coming for y'all on Game of Thrones, X-Men, and more. So if you're not already a subscriber, save your progress by clicking here. You'll be taken to our channel page where you'll find more episodes and be sure to subscribe while you're there. And do you think games matter? Are you curious about how they're designed, developed, and produced? Then we're sure you'll love an awesome channel called Extra Credits. Their videos are all about understanding how smart and powerful games can be. Click here to go check them out and tell them Wisecrack sent you. Alright, I've got a Metal Gear video to go work on. Catch you next time.